Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. وصلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم There is a hadith which can be found in Sunan al-Tirmizi that once the first khalif of Islam Sayyiduna Abu Bakr al-Anhu noticed white hair on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's beard, white hair on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's head. And Hazar Abu Bakr al-Anhu jokingly, playfully said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, O Prophet of Allah, you have become old. Sometimes we say this to our own friends, colleagues that when they are in their 20s or 30s and we see a white hair on their beard, we say to them, bro, you've become old. Similarly, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a, sorry, Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Anhu in a playful way said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, thou Prophet of Allah, you have become old. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied by saying, Surah Hud, the chapter about the people of the Hud, and its similar surahs have made me old. Rasulullah said, The chapter of Hud, which is in the 11th para, has made me old. Now, everybody knows how strong Rasulullah was physically, spiritually. And a question rises here as to how did Surah Hud make Rasulullah old? Everybody is aware of the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari during the Battle of Khandaq, also known as the Battle of Ahzab, when one of the companions, Hazrat Salman Farsi anhu gave advice to Rasulullah that if we were to build some trenches or pits, then we would be able to save ourselves from the mushrikeens of Makkah, from the pagans of Makkah, led by Abu Sufyan at that time, from invading Medina Munawwara. So what happened was that the Sahabas, they kept on digging their trenches, they were digging their pits and pits, they were hungry, until they came across a big massive rock. Now the Sahabas, they hadn't eaten for days, so they tried their best to break this particular rock, but they couldn't. So they went to Rasulullah and they said to Rasulullah Thou Prophet of Allah, there's a rock there, but we are unable to break it. So Rasulullah who himself hadn't eaten for many, many days, who had two stones tied around his belly, then picked up an axe and he hit the rock. And it's mentioned in another hadith of Musnad Ahmad that with the first strike, Rasulullah saw the treasures of Syria. And with the second strike, Rasulullah saw the treasures of Persia and with the third strike, Rasulullah saw the treasures of Yemen. But what we can gather from this hadith is how strong Rasulullah was. Even though he hadn't eaten for many, many days, he was still able to pick up a massive axe and was able to basically annihilate and make that big massive rock into hundreds and thousands of pieces. So Rasulullah was powerful, was strong, but even Surah Hud had made Rasulullah old. Now, why was that the case? Why did Surah Hud make Rasulullah old? It is because Surah Hud is a surah or is a chapter in the Quran which talks about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mass punishment. It talks about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ruthlessly destroys those, number one, who disobey his commands, number two, those who disobey his prophets, and three, more importantly, those who commit zulm. 
those who transgress, those who violate the rights of the servants, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his azab, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ruthlessly destroys nations, tribes and people. And there's one point I want to clarify here. Many people think that nations are destroyed based on kufr and shirk. That when a nation or when a group of people starts idol worshipping, say for example, that's when Allah's azab and punishment comes. Actually, when we look through the Quran, that is not the case. Because look, if that was the case, so many nations would have been destroyed. Even in the present, so many nations would have been destroyed if it was just based on kufr and shirk. But the actual reality is, it's only when that nation or that tribe, along with kufr and shirk, starts violating the rights of the servants, starts transgressing, starts going beyond the limits of the guidelines set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's when mass punishment comes. It doesn't come just because they are just worshipping idols. It doesn't come just because they are disbelievers. It comes along with the kufr and shirk when they start transgressing, when they start violating the rights of the servants, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's azab and punishment comes. And another point to remember as well, is that, just keep this point in mind, violating the rights of the servants is more serious in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than violating his own rights. Hukuk al ibad is more serious than Hukukullah. There's a prophet I'm sure you're going to be reading or listening to later on about Sayyiduna Shu'ayb alayhi salam. And Shu'ayb alayhi salam was sent to a region called Madian. Now the people of Madian, obviously they were worshipping idols. But there was another thing which they would do which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Sayyiduna Shu'ayb alayhi salam did not like. And what does Allah say in the Quran? Wala tankusul mikyala wal miza. Which means that the people of Madian, the people of Shuaib alayhi salam, they would decrease when it would come to measuring and weigh. In other words, somebody would go to the seller there and he will say to him, Here, there's 10 dirhams or there's 10 gold coins. Give me 10 kilograms of wheat. But what the seller would do. Instead of giving 10 kilograms of wheat, he would give him 9.5 kilograms of wheat or would give him 9 kilograms of wheat. So this was something which they would do, deceiving people, violating the rights of the servants. So when they didn't listen to Allah and his Rasul, Shu'ayb alayhi salam, what happened was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a mass punishment, (coughs) adab to destroy them. So what I'm trying to say is that violation of the rights of the servants is more serious and that invites the wrath and the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not just on kufr and shirk, as we're going to look at later, it does invite the wrath or anger of Allah, but he won't send a mass punishment to these people. But it's only when they do that and also violate the rights of these servants, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets really, really angry, really, really hurt. That's when azab, that's when punishment comes couple of hadiths I'm going to mention. There's a hadith which can be found in Sahih al-Bukhari where Rasulullah sallam has said that a martyr or somebody who is killed in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all his sins are forgiven. All his sins are forgiven. Then the hadith goes on to say illa dain except deaths except qars. So let's analyze this hadith. Somebody who sacrificed his life, his wealth, everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all his sins are forgiven. So any kind of bad sins which you may have done, any kind of small sins, they're all forgiven except one thing which Allah will not forgive and that is qars. That is debt. He borrowed money or sorry, he lent money to or he was he owes someone money I should say. <coughs> and then he didn't pay the debt off and then he went to fi sabilillah he went on to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now if he dies in that particular state all his sins are forgiven it's good but the debt which is outstanding Allah will not forgive that 
Why? Because the rights of the servants are important than rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another hadith which can be found in Sahih Muslim narrated by Sayyiduna Abu Hurairah al-Anhu that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked the companions who is a muflis? Mal muflis? Who is a bankrupt person? So the Sahabas, like you and I would have given the same answer if we were there. The Sahaba said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, a bankrupt person is someone who had a lot of money, a lot of wealth, and then he lost all his money and his wealth. That person is bankrupt. Rasulullah replied by saying, No. A bankrupt person, a muflis, is someone who comes to the day of judgment. He meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with uh, thousands and thousands of prayers and salahs behind him. Who meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with hundreds and thousands and thousands of fasting behind him. Who meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with hundreds and thousands of pounds worth of sadqah and charity behind him. Who meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with numerous hajj and umrahs behind him. And that person will be in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he could smell the fragrance of Jannah. He could see the doors of Jannah. And he'll be thinking, you know, when is that moment when Allah will say, okay, Abdullah, okay, Abdurrahman, proceed forward, enter Jannah, enter paradise. Now, when he thinks that he's got there, he's got into Jannah and paradise, then a person from behind would go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and would say to Allah, oh Allah, this person, he backbited about me. This person, he slandered about me. This person, he hurt my feelings. This person, he said this, he swore at me, say for example. All these kind of complaints to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then tell the angels that give this person sin, sorry, give this person's good deeds to this person who he has oppressed, the mazloom. Then another person will come and he'll make another similar complaint. Oh Allah, he did this to me, he did that to me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then order the angels that his good deeds give it to the mazloom and the oppressed uh, person. And this will continue to happen to the extent that that person who came with hundreds and thousands of prayers and zakat and sadaqat and numerous hajj and umrahs behind him, he comes to Allah now he's got nothing, zero. And if his day can't get any worse, there's still another queue of people still waiting to complain to Allah about him. So another person comes forward and he says, Oh Allah, he did this to me, he did that to me. So because he has got no good deeds left to give, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then order the angels that this oppressed person's bad deeds, bad actions, sins, give it or burden this person here. So what happens is that he comes to Day of Judgment, so many good deeds and actions now all of a sudden he has no good deeds but instead he's got thousands and thousands of sins of other people so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then tell the angels that send him to the fire of hell rasulullah sallallahu said he is a bankrupt person in this world if we lose our money we could still earn it the next day that person if he loses his good deeds in the hereafter he's got no other option no other way to earn the good deeds anymore because as soon as you leave this world that's it amal deeds bad deeds they all come to an end so these two hadiths are mentioned to show the brothers the severity of violating the rights of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also and also the severity of violating the rights of the servants and that allah's mass punishment and azab comes when people start violating the rights of servants now moving along in the legacy so far, I'm assuming you must have heard various lecturers or speakers talk about Adam alayhi salam, the first prophet and messenger of Allah. Then after Adam alayhi salam was Sayyiduna Shis alayhi salam, the next prophet and messenger of Allah. Thereafter it was Sayyiduna Idris alayhi salam. Then it was Sayyiduna Nuh alayhi salam. Now Sayyiduna Nuh alayhi salam had four sons. One of the sons was called Kan'an and he was a non-believer in terms of he did not believe in Nuh alayhi salam 
And when the flood came to destroy the people of Nuh, Canaan was holding on to the mountains. And Nuh was in the ark and he saw his son Canaan and he interceded to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, my son Canaan, he is from my family. Allow me to board him on the ark. So what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Innahu laysa min ahlik. That your son Canaan, he is not from your family. He is not from the believers. Innahu amalun ghayru salih. Because his actions were not of a good person, were not of a pious nature. فَلَا تَسْأَلْنِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ إِلْمٍ And do not ask me about things which you do not have knowledge of. In another verse, Allah says, فَلَا, تس, uh, فلا تُخَاطِبْنِي فِي الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا إِنَّهُمْ مُغْرَقُونَ That do not ask me, converse with me about the oppressed people, or the oppressors I should say, إِنَّهُمْ مُغْرَقُونَ Because these people are going to be drowned. So one of Nuh alayhi salam's son, Kanaan, he passed away, he died, he was drowned, he drowned during Nuh alayhi salam's time. So there were three sons remaining. One of them was called Sam, the other one was called Ham, and the third one was called Yafis. And from Sam, you have the progeny or the children of Arabs and Jews, i.e. the Jews and the Arabs are from the progeny of Sam. And the Africans, they are from the progeny of Ham. And the Chinese, Russians, Mongolians, they are from the progeny of Yafith. Now the people of Ad, to whom Sayyiduna Hud salam was sent, they were from the progeny of Sam, because the people of Ad, they were Arabs. They were of Arab descent. They were Arabs, they were from the people, or they were from Sam, his progeny. They were his children. And the people of Ad, they lived in a place called Ahqaf, which is in Hadrai Mot in Yemen. And they lived approximately 2,000 years before the coming of Isa alayhi salam. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the people of Ad. Honestly, Allah blessed them totally. They had authority, they had power, they had intellect. They were powerful people in terms of strength. They were gigantic people, huge people. And we're talking about in those days where there weren't any machines, with their own bare hands, they would carve out structures and buildings and houses from the mountains. They were massive people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them everything, gave them authority, power, gave them strength, physical strength. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them intellect. They were very, very clever, sharp people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them everything. Now the idea is that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you, and this is like in general here, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you with something, whether internal, in terms of eyes, ears, nose, in terms of brain, akal, intellect, or whether external blessings, in terms of wealth, mal, in terms of children, family, so on and so forth. The idea is that when Allah blesses you, is that you use these blessings <coughs> for the sake of Allah and His deed. All the blessings which we have, remember we're going to get questioned about in the hereafter. So if Allah has given us wealth and we are wasteful with our wealth, Allah will ask us in the hereafter, what did He do with it? idea is that you use that wealth for the sake of Allah, for his deen, to give da'wah, to convey the message of his deen. That's what you do with Allah's wealth. Allah has given you eyes. So you use the eyes for good things. You use the eyes to look around, to acknowledge the oneness of Allah. You should not use the eyes for bad things. <coughs> Similarly, knowledge and ilm. That is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what do you do with knowledge? Not like you just keep it for yourself. But instead you try to convey to brothers, you try to convey to youngsters, you try to teach, you know, teach Quran, teach Hadith, teach this, teach that. You convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So similarly, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the people of Ard with so many things, the idea was that they should use these blessings to acknowledge the oneness of Allah. But what happened was that the people of Ard, having these blessings in their armory, they used it for two things which Allah doesn't like. Number one, they used it to ascribe partners with Allah. In other words, they started worshipping idols. And number two, they started becoming proud and arrogant. Takabbur or kibar. So two things which they used their blessings for. They should have used it for good things, but instead they used it for bad things. They were number one, they started ascribing partners with Allah, idol worshipping. Or number two, and number two, they started becoming proud and arrogant. Takabbur and kibar. Now, I'm just going to explain them to you very quickly. Now, I think in this mosque as well, a few months ago, I did a talk on Tawheed, about the oneness of Allah. So I mentioned there that there are two parts of the oneness of Allah. There are two parts of Tawheed. One is what we call tawheed rububiya which means to believe that Allah is one. And on that point, many, many religions besides Islam believe in that. Jews believe that there is one God. Unitarian Christians believe that there is one God. Even the, some of the pagans of Makkah believed in one God. They believed in the existence of one God. Even the people of Ard, they also believed that, okay, there is a God. There is an existence of God. But the second thing, which is part of Tawheed, which we call in Arabic Tawheed Ubudiyya, which means to believe that only Allah is worthy of worship. One is to believe Allah is one, which a lot of people do besides Muslims. But then there's another thing, which is to believe that only Allah is worthy of worship. And that's where the people of Ard and the people of Makkah were lacking it. In terms of they believed in one God, but they would also say, well, we worship these idols. Why? Because these idols are going to intercede for us in the hereafter. So exactly the same with the people of Ard. They didn't deny the existence of God. They kind of accepted the existence, but the thing was that they were also worshipping idols at the same time. And they would say that these idols going to you know, intercede for us. These idols are going to take us to whatever paradise. Well, we're going to look at it later. They actually believe, but they would say this to Hud alayhi salam that if there was paradise, then you know, these idols will take us there. They believe that these idols are also worthy of worship. But it doesn't matter, it's shirk at this end of the day, which Allah didn't like. So that was one thing. And the second thing which they would do, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not like, was that they were proud and arrogant. Now proud or being like proud and arrogant, like the two things, pride and arrogance. There are two words in Arabic. One is this word called takabbur. And then there's another word which is called kibar. And sometimes we normally think the two to be the same, but actually there's a slight difference between the two. The word takabbur means to think yourself to be better than others. We call that takabbur. So let's say one person thinks himself to be better than this brother, that brother, that sister, that person, so on and so forth. We call that takabbur. And then there is another word in Arabic called kibar, which means that in your heart you just have this ego. You think to be special, you think to be it. You call that word kibar. But the hadith or the rule for both are the same. And that is as mentioned in the hadith of Sahih Muslim that Rasulullah has said that anyone who has an atom of pride and arrogance in his heart that person would not enter Jannah and Paradise. So these were the two things they were involved in, the people of Ard, I'll reiterate again. Number one was ascribing partners with Allah, idol worshipping, and number two was pride and arrogance. Now Alhamdulillah, it is the immense mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if he wanted, seriously, if he wanted, 
he could have destroyed the people of Ad. In particular, as soon as they started ascribing partners with Allah. It's mentioned in another hadith that whenever somebody ascribes partners with Allah, Allah becomes really, really angry. Seriously, no, we can't, we think we are angry. Think about Allah's anger. He gets really, really angry when somebody says, Nauzubillah, that he has a son. When somebody says, Isa is the son of Allah. Nauzubillah, when somebody says, Maryam is the wife of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Nauzubillah. When somebody makes these comments, Allah gets really mad. And if Allah wanted to, he could have destroyed everyone straight away. Forget about sending a prophet to them. Straight away, that's it, you're out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have done that. But instead, as mentioned in the hadith of Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expresses sabr and patience. He doesn't destroy them. But on top of that, summa yarzukuhum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides provisions for them. Even though they're making a slander against Allah, a buhtan against Allah that he has a son, even then Allah doesn't destroy them. He expresses sabr and patience. And then Allah provides for them, gives them food, gives them shelter, gives them everything, money. And not only that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is willing to forgive them as well. So when somebody commits shirk, <coughs> idol worshipping, Allah gets really angry that if he wanted, he could have destroyed the entire nation then and there. But it is the immense rahmah and mercy of Allah that he does it. He sends someone to those people to explain to them, to convey the message to them. As mentioned in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created 100 mercies and rahmah. And 1% or one part of mercy Allah has sent down to this world. Sometimes we see like a father loving, you know, like they pick up their the the son or the daughter and they kind of hug them and they kind of kiss them on their forehead on their cheeks and you know smiling you know laughing at them and we think to ourselves well, that you know the father loves the daughter or the father loves the son or sometimes we see the husband and wife they have a lot of love together that is only one percent of love and affection Allah has put in this world the other ninety nine percent Allah subhanahu wa taala inshallah will use for us in the hereafter. So that is the immense mercy of Allah. We think, you know, this father loves his son or daughter by just holding and kissing her. Allah's got 99 times more mercy than that. So it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's immense mercy that he doesn't destroy them straight away. What does he do? He sends a prophet and a messenger. That's one blessing. And the second blessing is that he doesn't send a messenger from another tribe, from another nation or from out of this world. He sends someone from their own tribe who understands them, who understands, as we say in Urdu, their mizaj, he understands how they are. So he sends somebody from their very own tribe to go and convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as mentioned in the Quran, Wa ila adin akhahum huda. That to the people of Ad, akhahum, we sent their brother, Hud alayhi salam. So again, as I was saying, this is Allah's immense mercy to send a prophet and a prophet from their own people to the people of Ad. Now Sayyidina Hud alayhi salam, he goes to the people of Ad and he conveys to them three messages. Number one, Ma lakum min ilahin ghayru. That there is no God besides Allah. So that's the first message to the people of Ad that you need to believe in the oneness of Allah Believe in terms of you believe in his existence and also only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worthy of worship. <coughs> Number two, the second message is La as'alukum alayhi ajra. That what I'm conveying to you, I'm not asking for any money. I'm not asking for any wages. Fair enough, if I was telling you that Okay, I'm going to give you advice about Allah and about the deen, but you need to pay me £10 an hour. You know, fair enough, I could understand you don't want to believe in me and so on because I'm very expensive. But I'm asking, this is free advice I'm giving you. La asalukum alayhi ajra. I'm not asking for any wages or money. Because as mentioned in another place in the Holy Quran, فَخَرَاجُ رَبِّكَ خَيْرُ وَهُوَ خَيْرُ Which means that the wages I'm going to get from Allah 
is more better. Or in other words, the reward and the thawab I'm going to get from Allah is far more better than what you're going to give me in this world. So I'm not asking for any wages or any money. So I'm giving you free advice. And the funniest thing nowadays is that people who do have problems, it could be stress or depression or anything like that. You know, the answers in the Quran and the Sunnah. So instead of going to an Imam who's going to be giving them free advice, according to the Quran and Sunnah, they'd rather go to the psychiatrist or a shrink or someone who's charging them 30 pounds, 50 pounds an hour, and they'd rather take that person's advice other than taking the advice of this Imam here who's going to be giving them free advice according to the Quran and Sunnah, because as our aqeed and belief is that the Quran, as mentioned the Quran as well, Shifa'ul Lima Fi Sudud is a cure for physical illnesses, like the story of Abu Sa'id al Khudr al Anhu, that when he went past the tribe and one of the leaders was uh, bitten by a scorpion. So he then recited Surah Fatiha and then that person became better. And also it is a shifa and a cure for any anxieties, for any depression, for any kind of difficulties of the heart. So instead of acting upon free advice of the Quran, they rather pay 50 pounds an hour, 60 pounds an hour to go to these doctors and so on where that person doesn't actually give them any good advice or any kind of cure. So Suhud al is saying that I'm giving you free advice. And number three, the third message he says to them is, do istighfar, do tawbah, repent for your shortcomings. Uh, seek forgiveness for what you have done, because if you do, yursil is sama alaykum midrara. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, will send rain, will shower his mercy, and also, wa yazidkum quwwatan ila quwwatikum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase you in your strength. And from here, one of our Aqabirins, Mufti Shafi Rahimullah from his Ma'riful Quran has derived that if you want strength, physical strength, you don't go to the gym. You do toba, you repent, you seek forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you strength, physical strength, spiritual strength. So all the gyms in the world would have been closed if all the Muslims had acted upon this particular verse. So three things here, uh, who the salam conveyed. Number one was to believe in Allah. Number two was to, like, I'm not asking for any wages. And number three is that repent and do istighfar, seek forgiveness for your shortcomings. Now when who the salam conveyed the message, the people of Ud, i.e. the people of Ad, they were very angry. And they started becoming menacing and fierce towards Hud alayhi salam. So they started saying to Hud alayhi salam, you know, who, you know, who on earth are you? Who are you to tell us that believe in a God and not to worship these idols? You know, who are you to tell us that, you know, do this, do that, to seek forgiveness, to seek Toba? You know, who on earth are you? Look at us. Look how powerful we are. Look at our strength. Look at our authority. Look what we have. And you telling us not to do this and to do that or not to do this and to do that. You know, who on earth are you? Now, Sayyidina Hud alayhi salam used a lot of wisdom here. Because what the people of Ad wanted was, they wanted an argument. And what normally happens in an argument, it starts off verbally, but then it goes to fisticuffs, doesn't it? And obviously, because the people of Ad were gigantic, were huge, you know, they would have easily, you know, overpowered Hud alayhi salam. So they wanted a kind of retaliation from Hud alayhi salam. So what did Hud alayhi salam say? Hud alayhi salam said that it's what we call in Arabic, it's mentioned in another place in the Holy Quran, Mira and Zahira, which is like apparent arguing. In other words, it means that you clearly state what you need to say. I, my message is, bus, believe in one God, you know, do this, refrain from ascribing partners with Allah. What you need to say, what you have been sent with, what is your message, you state that, you stipulate that. If that person wants to get into your argument, then you don't get into the argument. You clearly state your, what you need to say, you clearly state what you have been sent with. If that person wants to get into an argument, then you back off and then don't get into a full-blown argument. Because as all of the brothers probably know, you must have been in an argument before. 
that when you are in an argument, no, there's no winner, there's no loser. You don't really get anywhere, but instead it's more like a, a waste of time and it's something which shaitan likes. He likes to cause, you know, arguing and hatred and <coughs> jealousy and hasad, these kind of things between the believers. So never get into a full-blown argument. If somebody wants to debate with you, you tell them, okay, what you believe in or what your aqidah is or what your mazhab is. Or like, for example, when Jamaat brothers, when they go for gusht and so on, they state, you know, just come to the masjid and so on or, you know, come to deen. But if you want an argument, then don't get involved in the argument. And as I said, this is a teaching of the Holy Quran where Allah says, فَلَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مِرَا and زَاهِرًا I'll just explain why Allah said this. It's actually about the people of the cave, Surah Kahf, where, as you, some of the uh, brothers will know, there were some youngsters and they kind of rebelled against the tyrant king of that particular time. His name was Dakianus. They rebelled against him. They went inside a cave and they uh, hid there and they fell asleep. And as the Quran goes on to say that fell asleep for 309 years. But what happened was that after they woke up, there was some kind of debate amongst the Christians of that time and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Sahaba. <coughs> so the Christians would say, Salasatur Rabi'uhum Kalbuhum. That there were only three of them and the fourth one was their dog because what happened, the dog also accompanied these youngsters into the cave. So some Christians would say that no, there were three youngsters and the fourth was the dog. Then he goes on to say, khamsatun sadisuhum kalbuhum. Then they would, some others would say that no, there were five of them, but the sixth was their dog. Then the correct one which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is sab'atu wa thaminuhum kalbuhum. That no, there were seven youngsters and the eighth was the dog. Then Allah says, فَلَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرًا Which means that when he tells the Christians, this is an order to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that when he converses with the Christians, because they're not going to listen to him, because they believe it's three or they believe it's five, but you tell them it's seven and the eighth was the dog, Mira and Zahira are apparent arguing without going into a, a full-blown argument. So as I was saying that this is the, the wisdom of Hud alayhi salam he used, he said to them that, okay, you believe in one God, but I don't want to get into a, a full-blown argument with you. Then they asked Hud alayhi salam that, okay, uh, just say if we don't believe in you. So we don't believe in you that there is one God. We don't want to listen to you. What's going to happen to us then? You know, who's going to stop us? So Hud alayhi salam responded by saying that if you do not believe in Allah, if you do not believe in one God, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then punish you and deal with you then. <coughs> now when they heard the word resurrection, the people of Ard started cracking up. So what's, what's this person saying, Hud alayhi salam? What's he saying that when we are turned into dust, when we are turned into bones, that we are going to be resurrected? You know, because remember the, those who don't believe, uh, they didn't believe in life after death. So they couldn't understand the concept that when your bones, everything have turned into dust and soil, you're going to be resurrected. They couldn't believe in that. So when they heard Hud alayhi salam talking about resurrection, they totally cracked up. They were saying, what's this person saying? He's saying to believe in God. And now he's saying to us that oh, if we don't, then we're going to get resurrected. You know, how can, uh, how, how on earth can we get resurrected? When we are turning to dust and soil, how on earth anyone, you know, any supernatural being, could resurrect someone. So they couldn't believe what Hud alayhi salam had just said. So Hud alayhi salam again tried to make them understand that look, Allah's system demands that there has to be justice. What happens in this world is that there's always a conflict between good and evil. There's always good and at the same time there's always evil as well. There'll always be brothers, good brothers who are inviting others to the deen. But there will always be other brothers, other people who will be inviting others to shaitan's path. Similarly, during Prophet ﷺ's time, he was inviting people towards deen, towards jannah, towards paradise. And then you had Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal, who were inviting you know, the people towards you know, kufr and jahannam. So there will always be a kind of conflict of 
good and evil. And sometimes what happens in this world is that evil temporarily overpowers the truth, overpowers good. <coughs> but eventually, as Allah says, Ja al haqq wa zahaq al batil, that the haq will overpower the evil. But sometimes there could be certain period or certain era where evil is overpowering the haq and the truth. So now justice demands, Allah being al adil, it demands that there has to be a day of judgment where all the injustices of this world can be put to right as I already explained about the hadith of the bankrupt person so there has to be a place and a time where the the weak who were obviously oppressed in this world and they couldn't be compensated they have to and obviously the oppressor the zalim they have to be in front of Allah so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can judge between the two so obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to uh, sorry, who the Islam was explaining to the people that you need to believe in hereafter. You know, this Allah's justice demands that there has to be a day of judgment where all the injustices of this world can be put to right. Thereafterwards, again, they kept on mocking who the Islam. So, Sayyidina who the Islam reminded the people of art of the people of Nuh. Like, look what happened to the people of Nuh. They didn't believe in God, they didn't believe in Allah. Look what happened to them, they were destroyed. Again, they weren't willing to listen to Sayyiduna Hud alayhi salam. So then, the last thing, <coughs> the last slander the people of Ard made against Hud alayhi salam was what we call nowadays as a character assassination. In other words, they were calling Hud alayhi salam a lunatic. They were calling him mad. They were calling him insane. Basically, they said look you're lying they were using these kind of words that you know why has Allah sent you as a prophet and a messenger and the last thing they came up with is that actually do you know what we believe you to be a lunatic we think you just like you come out of a mental hospital and it's like you know saying uttering some nonsense which we don't believe in so that was the last thing they mentioned as I said this is what we call a character assassination and this is a lot of people do this nowadays as well no one will say directly that Islam is bad. But what they will do is that they will say, okay, these Imams and these leaders, they bad. So then what happened? They put this picture to the people. Oh, if the Imam is doing bad, or if the Imam is bad, then what kind of religion is this? So then they get put off by religion and the deed. Actually, it's not true what the Imam is not doing anything wrong or bad, but people will make up some rumors that the Imam does this, the Imam does that, the scholar does this, the Alim does that. So then people get this bad picture, oh, this Alim is like this. So if the Alim is like this, who's supposed to be the, the forerunner of the religion, what kind of religion is Islam? So people then put off, are put off by the deen, are put off by the religion. So exactly the same way the people of Ard, they were saying to the people that, look, don't listen to who he's just mad, he's a lunatic, he's insane, he's saying some nonsensical things, you know, he's, nonsense what he's talking about don't listen to him don't believe in him at all now obviously Hud alayhi salam at that time had to fight back in a way so he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to give them one last chance so he sends an azab you could say but the azab isn't the the final nail in the coffin it's just like a beginning azab a beginning punishment so what happens is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sends a drought over the area of Ahqaf, over that particular region. So for many, many days, there's no rain at all. The sun is you know, scorching, it's hot. People are dying out of hunger. The livestock, the cattle, the camels, the cows, they are all dying. Hardly any food at all. So remember, a drought is also a punishment as well. So Allah gave that initial drought so that they can mend their ways, rectify their actions. So what happened was that they then came to Sayyiduna Hud alayhi salam and said to Hud alayhi salam, Oh Hud, you know, what's this, what's this drought? Where has all this come from? So Hud alayhi salam reminded them that, look, this drought is because of your disobedience. It's because of you not listening to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now they had a great opportunity to repent there. They had a great opportunity to basically rectify their actions, do tawbah, 
repent, seek forgiveness, and change their ways. Because remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a chance to repent. But when that chance goes, then there's no more doors of tawbah and repentance anymore. As mentioned in the hadith of Sahih Muslim, uh, actually of Sunan Tirmizi, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the tawbah and repentance of a servant ma'lam yugharghir as long as the soul does not reach the throat because as mentioned in another hadith that when the soul reaches the throat and it's about to come out that person is then shown his abode in the hereafter so if he was a good person kutiba maq'aduhu min al jannah he'll be shown his abode in jannah and if he was a bad person then he'll be shown his abode in the hereafter in the fire of hell so when that happens there's, you, before the soul reaches the throat, you can get away with it. You can do tawbah. You can repent. Allah can accept. But when it reaches there and the veil of the world goes away and then you see Jannah or Jahannam or whatever your abode is, there's no tawbah anymore. There's no repentance anymore. So this was like a beginning azab, the drought, the punishment. They had to you obviously, uh, if they wanted, if they repented, Allah would have forgiven them. But instead, what happened was that they then went against Hud salam's words. They said, no, no, we don't believe in you. Again, you're talking nonsense. You're talking garbage. And obviously, at that time, the last opportunity they had of Tawbah, that also went away as well. One day thereafter, all of a sudden, again, the drought's been going on for weeks, days, months. Only Allah knows best. All of a sudden, they see a cloud. A cloud in the sky so now they leave their tents they leave their buildings and they start rejoicing start you know thank you know like you know glad tidings to everyone happy you know like a sigh of relief that oh finally the you know rain is coming our drought is gonna finish so they're all rejoicing happy you know laughing giggling you know they think okay that's it the droughts over the rain's gonna come, our crops, our vegetation's gonna grow, our remaining camels or cattle, whatever they were, are gonna survive. We're gonna survive. We could then build for the future. So Hud alayhi salam said to them that don't get happy. This is not a rain cloud. This is not a cloud which is going to give you rain. But instead, what happened was that this was a cloud, as Hud alayhi salam was saying to them, which is going to bring azab and punishment. So what then happened, the weather all of a sudden changed quickly. It was hot, boiling, the sun was like scorching, but all of a sudden Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the weather and the warm and the heat turned into cold, blustery wind, into a gale force wind. And every second or so the speed of the wind was increasing, increasing into a massive whirlwind and a tornado. And what happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it to the people of Ahqaf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the people of Ahqaf. The buildings they had, the trees themselves, they themselves, they were like uprooted from the heavens, uh, sorry, from the earth. And they were tossed from one place to another. They were flung from one place to another. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that this azab and punishment lasted for eight days and seven nights. And eventually they became ka'annahum a'jazu nakhlin khawiyah. That they became like trunks of a date palm tree. What does that mean? Trunks of a date palm tree? I uh, just imagine there's a, a fire, like to say there's a tornado. And a tornado or a, or a strong wind, it uproots the tree. If, if it makes it fly from one place to another, it gets tossed from one place to another then after the tornado or the wind finishes what's left of that tree bits and bobs of the trunk so this exactly happened to the people of art they were like flung from one place to another one corner of Ahqaf to another they were like tossed upwards then tossed down it's like you could say a kind of a fun fair game like you know all of like a right sorry like going all over the place that's how they were but what was left of them was one or two bits of kidneys, 
one or two bits of intestines, one or two bits of a leg, one or two bits of an arm that was left with them. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala vividly mentions it in the Holy Quran. So this was how the people of Ad were destroyed. Now there is a saying in Arabic when it says which means that the stories of the past is a lesson for the people of the future. So all the stories, or the story which we just read, and probably what you're gonna, what you've read before, or heard before, and what you're gonna hear and read later, is not so that it, you know we listen with it with one ear, then it goes out of another. The purpose is that we take some lessons from it. So very briefly, what can we understand from the story of the people of Ard and how they were destroyed? Number one, what we can understand is not to disobey Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Imam Ghazali rahimullah, a very famous scholar, once mentioned that any guna, any sins, is considered to be a big sin. Normally we kind of differentiate between a smaller sin and a big sin. But Imam Ghazali rahimullah says that any sin, any disobedience of Allah is a big sin. So what we can understand from this story, and what we should take heed from, is that we should not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if we do disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we don't repent for what we have done Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's azab and mass punishment may come to us as well number two the second point which we can understand from this hadith and in actually mentioning the story but I'll just kind of briefly mention it here as well is that acceptance of Allah or being accepted by Allah that what you're doing is good is not based on wealth and is not based on children is not based on power is not based on authority many people in particular and I may be a bit offending some of the brothers but sometimes you have some brothers they are on a committee of a mosque and there's no deen in them in terms of they hardly even come to the masjid to pray salah so they are the committee members and they think that's it, I've reached it, I'm accepted by Allah because I'm a committee member. Remember, being accepted by Allah is not based on having power, it's not based on authority, it's not based on wealth or anything like that. It's based on your level of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what I'm trying to say is that because this is what the people of Ard said as well, I didn't mention in the story, but this is one of the things they said to Hud alayhi salam that Oh, if there is resurrection, then what will happen? Because Allah has blessed us with wealth and children and power in this world, that means that that's a sign of our acceptance. That's a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us. So in turn, that means that in the hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us even more. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us Jannah and Paradise. So what they didn't recognize and this was also a lot of people, as I said, even some Muslims nowadays think of it as well in this way that, oh, if we are, if we weren't accepted, then why has Allah made us a committee member? You know, why has Allah given us wealth? Why has Allah given us this? Why has Allah given us that? So, one thing which should be clarified here is that uh, acceptance by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not based on power, is not based on authority, is not based whether you're a member or committee member of a masjid or a madrasa or a markaz it's based on your level of proximity and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah we leave the story at this uh, uh, part may Allah give us the tawfiq to act upon what has been said wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen